Acts this morning. Acts chapter number four. I remember growing up hearing uh, stories, and I'm sure we've all heard the stories of the great prayer warriors <coughs> of years gone by. I'm reminded of Prang Hyde, one. Uh, I remember a personal experience I had uh, with a gentleman. It, it doesn't seem like you could come across very many uh, anymore today, but uh, sometimes you come across just a prayer warrior that when they pray, well, I tell you what, it just seems like all heaven just stops to hear what they have to say. Uh, I remember a man, we called him, a, uh, we called him Boss. Uh, he was a of the Neighborhood Bible Time. I uh, worked with uh, Children's Evangelism uh, with a group, Neighborhood Bible Time. Uh, Boss Homeshirt was his name. And uh, boy, this man, uh, we would get together, and all of the 50 of us evangelists would get together with uh, Brother Homeshirt there, and he'd begin to pray. And every time he prayed, you could just feel heaven. Seems like just opened up and everybody just went, shh, let's hear what he uh, has to say. And boy, I'll tell you what, what a man uh, of prayer that that man was. Uh, and uh, I've heard stories, I was reading not too long ago, I've heard the story as well of a missionary who was out in the dark jungles uh, of Africa somewhere and he came back and was sharing the story at a church, of one of his supporting churches, how he had been in a dark jungle somewhere that was very dangerous and how God had protected him. And uh, there were some people that were there, and uh, as as the, they began to share the story, they began. Uh, somebody stood up and uh, they said, "Brother, we we were praying for you that night." And what had happened was uh, he was there. And there were twenty seven uh, men who were about to attack and to kill this missionary because they knew that he had some supplies. And they came to him and they told him, uh, "You have guards around you." And this missionary said, I had no guards around me. It was just me there by myself. They said, no, you had 27 guards that were there with you. And uh, these, this group of men told him this. And he came back and was telling the church. And they said, well, what night was that? He told them the night that had happened. And the church said, we were praying for you. Uh, one man said, God laid on my heart to pray for you specifically. And he said, those of you who prayed for the missionary, raise your hand. Raised the hand, and there were 27 hands that went up. And uh, there were 27 guards for that missionary uh, that night. And we see and hear stories of God doing great things and God moving through prayer in mighty ways. But I believe that this powerful prayer can be experienced by all believers. I don't think it's just to a select few. I think that all believers can have this same type of power in our prayer life. And we ask, well, how do we have such a power in our prayer life? Well, we're already in the book of Acts chapter number 4. We're going to take a look at an example of prayer that was so powerful, it caused the room itself to shake. I love this story. First, though, we find Peter and John in chapter 3. You stay there in verse uh, chapter 4 there. They're healing a man in chapter 3. And God gives them opportunity to preach, and so they take advantage of this opportunity. And while they are preaching, there in Acts chapter 3, they are taken and they are placed in prison. And then the next day they are brought before the council. They are scolded strongly and warned uh, to never preach or teach in the name of Jesus again, or there will be very serious consequences. Now they've been let loose, and having been loosed after this strong warning, now in Acts chapter 4, verse 23, we find here Peter and John, and this is where we will begin to learn about praying in power. And I want to take a look at these verses. As we begin to take a look at this, we find this in being let go, verse 23. They went to their own company. And report all that the chief priests and elders had said unto them. I want you to notice where they went to after they were let go. They went to their own company. Let me say first of all, I'm glad that in this room I'm among my own company. Yeah, I am glad right now that I have Christian friends that I can go to. That I can say this is my own company. And this is where the apostles went to. By the way, with whom you keep company makes a great impact on your prayer life. Right. Yep. Let me ask you this. Do the friends you have, your closest friends, do they pray for you? What about this? Do they pray with you? Right. Or do they challenge you even to pray even more? Amen. The people with whom you keep the company 
dealing with will, uh, in fact, affect your prayer life. So they go back to your own company who was gathered together in verse 24. And when they had heard that, notice what they did. They lifted up their voice to God with one accord. They prayed in unity. You have a group of people gathered together for a single purpose, praying for a single outcome. They pray in one accord. By the way, you cannot pray in unity with an unbeliever. For the Bible says, what fellowship hath Christ with Belial? Right. You can only pray in unity with a fellow believer. Right. You say, well, how can we do this? You can do this because you both serve the same God. I think of Ephesians chapter number 4. In this passage, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1, it says, I therefore the prisoner of the Lord beseech you that ye walk worthy of the vocation wherewith ye are called, with all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit, that's verse 3, and the bond of peace, verse 4, there is one body and one spirit, even as ye are called in one hope of your calling. Verse 5 says, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. And verse 6, uh, verse six one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. Every believer has the same God living in them. You can pray in unison and in unity with believers. We serve the same God. The word unity, when I looked it up in the dictionary, it means this, the state of being one. The absence of diversity. Oneness of mind. By the way, the church ought to be this. When we get together to pray, this ought to be how we pray. When we get together to do ministry, this is how we ought to do ministry. In unity. As among a number of persons, it says concord, harmony, or agreement. Now I realize there are a multitude of different personalities in our congregation. I understand that, but it does not mean we cannot come together in unity to accomplish a great purpose that God has for us. And I like what Matthew 18 verses 19 and 20 tell us. Very familiar verses here. Again, I say unto you that if two of you shall agree on earth, see, praying in unity together, as touching anything that ye shall ask, it shall be done for them of my Father which is in heaven. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. And I like that idea that when you come together in unity, God hears your prayer. And that's why it's okay to call a friend or to go to a friend and to pray with somebody. God likes to hear people praying in unity. But we find this is exactly what they did. They lifted up their voices in one accord. Let's keep reading as we see. It says, And said, Lord, Thou art God, which has made heaven and earth and the sea and all that in them is. This is a place where many of us fall short in our own prayer life. They take time before they say anything else, they acknowledge who God is. Oh, man. It is important that we acknowledge who God is. You say, well, it's hard for me to think of who God is. I'm, I can't always think of that. Well, let me help you out. God is the Alpha, Omega, the beginning and the ending. God is the great I am, the creator of the universe, the giver of life, the sustainer of life, the savior of my soul, Amen. the rock to which I run, the giver of strength when I am weak, the one who comforts me when no one else can. Right. He is the sovereign God, the almighty God, the tower in which I hide. He is the provider of my needs, the one who cares for me when all have forsaken me. Right. He is the lover of my soul, the king of all, the Lord of all, the one who makes me worthy, the advocate for all believers. Amen. He is the God who can carry my burdens, forget my sins, never leave me, and always loves me. Amen. That's the God that we serve as right. Christians. When we take time to acknowledge who God is and the greatness of God, we see then that God is powerful and our problems are powerless before such an awesome right. God. And this is right. why we need to acknowledge who God is. We realize how great 
He is. It reminds me of the little chorus that says, All oh Lord God, it's also a passage in the Bible, but All oh Lord God, Thou hast made the heavens and the earth by Thy great power. This chorus says, All oh Lord God, Thou hast made the heavens and the earth by Thy outstretched arm. And nothing is too difficult for Thee. Yeah. Nothing is too difficult for Thee. God. Great and mighty God. God. Great and power and mighty indeed. Nothing, nothing, absolutely nothing, nothing is too difficult for Thee. Yeah. And it would do us good before we get to crying and whining and complaining about how bad our life is to take time to see how great our God is yeah. and realize nothing is too difficult for the God that we serve. And we can get on page with God and realize that He is able to handle all of our problems that come our way. Right. He is absolutely all-powerful and nothing, absolutely nothing is too difficult for our God. Right. Yes. In verse 25, notice, Who by the mouth of thy servant David has said, Why did the heathen rage and the people imagine vain things? The kings of the earth stood up and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against His Christ. They took time. Here's another part of our prayer life that is very weak. Uh, I dare say, in most Christians, we don't take time to quote the scripture when we pray. This is exactly what they did. If you want to know where this is, this is Psalm chapter number 2. The first few verses of Psalm chapter 2 says this. They take time in their prayer time to quote scripture. Now, if I may give you a very personal experience that I had with this, uh, in particular, whenever Holly and I, uh, with our first child, Sierra, as, as most of them, pretty, 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 probably pretty much everybody here knows, uh, Sierra was born, she lived for 20 days and passed away, the Lord took her home. But I remember that first night, that next morning uh, when she was uh, very weak, and they said, she will not make it to the next day. And at 4 o'clock in the morning, I call my pastor, I call my Christian friends. By the way, a good Christian friend will come at 4 o'clock in the morning. And I had a couple of them. And they showed up, and it was me and Holly, and, and Holly's mom, and my pastor, and, and, and I believe his wife may have been there, and, and uh, my Christian friend was there as well. And we gathered around Little Sierra. We were sitting there. The, the doctors had backed up and had taken time. They closed off the little room so we could say goodbye. I've been there. I've been taking part of that whole scenario. And so they all said, we'll just walk from another room. They put us in this area. And they all went somewhere else to close us in. And I remember seeing Holly as she took her hand and put it in the little incubator where Sierra was. We couldn't touch her. She was too fragile. We touched her. She did immediately uh, go into eternity. So all she could do was put her hand over her. And she began to sing and praise God uh, in that moment of crisis when she had just been told that her baby would be gone in a matter of moments and that her oxygen blood level was so low they said she won't make it for another two hours. And she began to sing, Lord, of course, His truth is perfect. And I'm so thankful that His strength is indeed perfect. Yeah. And we watched Rose Sierra that morning as she sang that chorus. Her blood level went up a couple degrees. And my Christian friend said, let's start praying. We said, let's do this. Let's pray. My Christian friend began to pray. Guess what my Christian friend did? He began to quote scripture in his prayer. And we saw little Sierra's blood level go up even more to where it's supposed to be. And we began to sing, worship, pray, praise, spend time talking to God in unity, in one accord. And by the end of that day, by 11 o'clock that morning, Sierra Grace was back where she was supposed to be at, where they could take care of her. And uh, I'm thankful that we had that experience to see God move in a miraculous Amen. way that morning, sitting there Amen. in the hospital. Amen. And it was a testimony to the nurses and the doctors of how great God is. Right. Yes, sir. And even to this day, it's a testimony that when we get together in unity, I have personal experience of seeing God do great things. Right. When believers come together and they praise God in their prayer, and they quote the scripture to God in their prayer. And we find here that prayer and scripture go hand in hand. The problem is we don't use them together enough. Right, right. Let me ask you this. Do we even know enough scripture to quote back to God? Amen. Right. Well, we know Romans 3.23, but there's more in there than just that. Right. What about this? When was the last time you even used the Bible in your prayer? There's been a couple times praying, 
thought would come to my mind, I began to pray, and I said, Lord, I can't remember where that is. Hold on just a second. Drive. Look it up. Oh. <laughs> Why not? Drive. Lord, lay something on your heart. Take time to look it up and pray back to Him. Drive. Lord, I know it's in the Bible, and I want to look it up. Well, there's nothing wrong with that. This boss home shirt. He was, he was quite a character when he prayed. He would, he would pray and talk to God, and in the middle of his praying to God, he talked to his evangelist. It would be something like this, dear Lord, be with this evangelist. As they go out and evangelize you, make sure that you're enthusiastic. And God help them to make sure that when they uh, go out and they preach the word. Now, evangelists, you better make sure that when you... And so we're doing this. Oh, are we praying or are we talking? Are we <laughs> so, but we find here that it is okay to pray to God and to quote scripture back to Him. Right. This is exactly right. what they do. Notice in verse number 27. For of a truth against thy holy child, Jesus, whom thou hast anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate with the Gentiles, and the people of Israel were gathered together. Right. By the way, they acknowledge right here the fulfillment of prophecy. Yeah. They acknowledge who God is. They acknowledge the fulfillment of prophecy. Notice verse 28, though. For to do whatsoever thy hand and thy counsel determined before to be done. Right. Right. Now let me say a word here that a lot of bachelors are afraid of. That is sovereign. Yeah. Our God Amen. is a sovereign God. Right. He knows exactly what is taking place. Right. He knows exactly uh, what is going to happen. Not only does He know, but He does ordain situations to take place. We see that happening right here. They acknowledge the fulfillment of prophecy, and they also show God's sovereignty. They said, we know that you had preordained for Jesus to come and to die on the cross because He is sovereign King and He's sovereign Ruler. By the way, this gives us comfort. This gives me comfort to know that God is sovereign because He's in control of everything. Right. I may not be, and many times I am not in control of everything. <laughs> I'm barely in control of what I'm supposed to do, much less anything else. Right. I barely can make it to work, much less anything else. But I'm thinking that when the problems come my way and throw me off kilter, that my God is still in control. Amen. This also gives us reassurance that God is not surprised at what we are facing. Right. And He can handle our every problem. Right. And we may get a surprising phone call, a surprising letter, a surprising text message, a surprising Facebook note, a surprising whatever that surprises and throws us off kilter and turns our world upside down. But this never surprises God. Right. God is always in control. He's always able to handle every problem and every situation that we face in our life. When we go through a difficult time, we must learn to give that over to our God and see Him work that situation out. Notice verse 29. And now, Lord, behold their threatenings. Now they take time to acknowledge the threat. After all the things that they've already prayed, now they acknowledge the threat that have been placed. That if you preach... You will be beaten. You will be put in prison. You will have these things uh, take place to you. By the way, let me say, it is okay to vocalize your concerns right. to God in prayer. It's okay to say, Lord, I don't understand. Lord, I don't understand. Lord, I am concerned. Lord, I have this coming my way. And Lord, I need assurance. Lord, I need help. Lord, I don't know what to do. Right. It is okay to admit to God that you have concerns. Right. Right. And it's okay to let God know how, how you feel threatened. Lord, I, I, they're, they're threatening me over here at work. They're threatening me over here with my family, over here with my friends, or over here at, uh, out in the community. They're threatening me over here. And Lord, I feel threatened. And it may even be, Lord, I, I need some time just to understand, God, I need you to help me. Right. This is why we get together with other friends. But notice, they said, behold, their threatenings. And he, they tell them, uh, he acknowledged, they acknowledge the threatenings that are coming their way. Notice, and grant unto thy servants with all boldness they may speak 
thy have all boldness, they may speak thy word. They acknowledge the threatenings, which we do that. That's pretty easy for us to do. Uh, but we do too much of it. It becomes whining and griping. But we ought to make sure that we can let God know the threatening that we have. But they take time after this to ask God for boldness to do what's right. Amen. Sometimes it's easy to do wrong. Yes. But it's always better and best to do what's right. Amen. Even when it goes against what the leaders of that day said, Lord, we need boldness. They said we're not supposed to preach, but God, we need boldness to preach. Amen. Well, they said we're not supposed to do this, but God, we need boldness to go and do what we're supposed to do. Amen. Do you not think that them being humans had a little bit of fear of the council of the leaders of that day? Yes, there was physical fear, but they had a Holy Ghost that gave them boldness. Wow. And they said, Lord, they said we can't do this, but you have told us to. And Lord, Amen. we are asking for boldness, even though it goes against what we've been told. Amen. Lord, we need to follow you. Notice in verse 30. It says, by stretching forth thine hand, here is their ministries here, stretching forth thine hand to heal, and that signs and wonders may be done by the name of thy holy child Jesus. Yes. Uh, amen. They take time to acknowledge that it was God's hand stretching out to heal. You do not need my hand on your forehead to heal you. God's hand is able to reach. They did not do the signs and wonders for their own ministry's sake. Boy, we can stop there for just a minute. How many of these ministers do you find? They have these great healing ministries so that they can be on the big news of TBN, the Trinity Broadcasting Network, the voice of all charismatics. <laughs> That's not the one, but it should be. No, it is. Not true. And they, they have these big, and now they have all these thousands of people. They're gathered together not to see what God can do, but to see this ministry that they have. Right. Or they didn't do it for fame, so everybody would know who they are. Instead, it was all done for the glory of God. Yeah. Through the name of the Holy Child Jesus. Right. By the way, this also acknowledges that Jesus is God. Because we first see God's hand stretching out to heal. And now the signs were done by the name of God the Son. And His name is Jesus. In other words, it's all about God. It wasn't about me. It wasn't about my ministry. It wasn't about my goals. It wasn't about my dreams. It's about God. They said, Lord, it is your hand that is healing. It's not my hand. It's not my shadow. It's not my anything. God, it is you that does these things. Notice verse 31. And when they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together. Boy, in the Old Testament, they would pray. A couple times you read the prayer, especially that of Solomon. And it was so full of smoke from the Holy Ghost. Uh, from God moving in, they couldn't even minister. Boy, to be in a place like that. And I've been in a couple places where you have so much people crying and weeping and getting right. It took a long time for anybody to ever step up to even minister. Yeah. No need for the fourth and fifth song or the second song. Some people walk in and there would be such a strong spirit. I've been in one or two of those services in my life. And boy, what a moving the Holy Spirit that is. Amen. Amen. Let me say, it was shaken because God was present. Amen. Right. Their whole prayer was selfless. If we could get over that, we would find a lot of prayer, a lot of power in our prayer. Stop. Yeah. We need to stop praying selfish prayers right. and start praying selfless prayers. Right. Right. Their prayer was that of selflessness, asking God to give them boldness to preach the word despite the warnings of the leaders. It wasn't for their own sake. It was for the people's sake. They needed to preach the word. They could be obedient. They knew that if they went out to preach, that would be in direct violation of the law. By the way, if the law of any land contradicts the word of God, God's word always rules the Amen. Amen. There ever comes a time when they say you cannot preach the word of God, the word of God is to rule supreme and you're to preach the word of God. Amen. Here's a verse for you. Acts 5.29 says, We ought to obey God rather 
Amen, man. We ought to obey God rather than man. And that is in direct uh, uh, idea. They had already been brought before the council once again, and they were asked the question, why are you doing this? Why did you not listen to us? They said, we ought to obey God rather than man. In the Old Testament, Daniel did this, and God delivered him from the lions then. <coughs> Three Hebrew boys practiced obeying God rather than man. They refused to bow down to the idols. And God spared them from the fiery furnace. The apostles did this, and they were put in prison. They suffered persecution for it. Sometimes we're led to believe that if you, if you do what God wants you to do, everything is going to be perfect in your physical life. No, sometimes you're going to face persecution. There's going to be some times of suffering. For Christians, even if we follow after God, and when we fall after God rather than man, because this is the devil's world. My father created it, but the devil right now is a prince of the power of the air. Right. It is a cursed world. It is under the curse of sin. And men are that of the curse of sin. And when we do after God, Satan is not like that when we follow yeah. after God. So he will bring persecution our way. It will happen. Notice. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. See, when our prayer is directed to God, about God, and, the power, and in the power of God, He shows up. Too many times we pray about our problems or our situations and our sadnesses, and we neglect to acknowledge God's power, God's Word, God's greatness, and God's presence. It's okay to tell God about your threatenings, but don't forget how great your God is. Amen. There's been a few times I've been telling God about my problems and my sorrows and my woes, and I got a more discouraged than I did when I got down on my knees. You say, how did that happen? Because I didn't acknowledge how great God was. Right. You need to acknowledge how great God is. Powerful prayer involves the believer or group of believers praying in unity to God the Father. Through the leading of the, and the power of the Holy Spirit and in the name of Jesus. Right. In other words, powerful prayer brings a full triune God and the humble believer together. With this combination, we can do great things through God because we are going the same direction as the triune God is going. Amen. And powerful prayer takes place. When the believer gets in the way that God is going, instead of trying to put God in the way we are going. Right. God, I know you're leading me to go here, but I really want to do this. So if you'll bless what I'm doing, why don't we obey what God does and say, God, why don't you bless what you want me to do? I'm doing this. Bless this. Right. And I can take you to Genesis 24 and tell and read to you the story. I won't take time right now to read the whole idea of Abraham's servant who goes and looks for a, a, a bride for Isaac. And he goes, he goes to the well there and he begins to pray. And before he's even done speaking, here comes Rebecca. The answer to his prayer. And then, later on in verse 25 of Genesis 24, he had asked her if there was room for them. She said, Moreover unto him, we have both strong property enough and room to lodge in. Verse 26 says, And the man bowed down his head and worshiped the Lord. The answer to your prayer ought to bring worshiping to God. Amen. But I like this. In verse 27, he said, Blessed be the Lord God of my master Abraham, who hath not left destitute my master of his mercy and his truth. I, being in the way, the Lord left. To the house of my master's brethren. Right. When you give in the direction God wants you to go, that God is going, God will bless. Amen. This is why we pray through the power and the leading of the Holy Spirit yeah. in the name of Jesus. Because what we ask in the name of Jesus and the Holy Spirit is guiding us, He will answer that prayer. Amen. It will happen. God blesses and there is a power in our prayer. When we get in the way that God is going. Finally, and they spake the word of God with boldness. Yes. Because of the way they prayed, God answered their prayers yes. and filled them with boldness. And it was because of this prayer that the apostles were able to have boldness. We find later that some of these same men are described as these that have turned the world upside down. And if God can 
used these ordinary men to do such great things and pray in such power. I believe that He can certainly take us ordinary people today, the 21st century, and He can do the same with us and cause us to pray in extraordinary power as well. Today, believer, I challenge you to come and ask God for that power. Lord, help me to learn to pray with power. May I be a prayer warrior. May I be a person of prayer that when I pray, there is power in my prayer. Ask Him to transform our prayer life. Not just change it a bit. I mean transform it. When I look at my prayer life, I don't mean just to change. I need a whole, complete transformation of how I pray. We need to ask Him to make it real again, powerful again, and purposeful again. Amen. Lord, take my prayer life and change it, Amen. transform it, make it something completely new. Amen. And He will. And you will find that there is power in your prayer Amen. when you do this. Good. Bow your heads and close your eyes. Let me look.